welcome to the latest instalment in my series questions about Anne Boleyn. Um, I'm Claire Ridgway, I'm the founder of the Anne Boleyn Files website, also the author of several books on Anne Boleyn and the Boleyn family, including The Fall of Anne Boleyn, A Countdown. Now today I wanted to talk about and answer, if I can, the question did Anne Boleyn have much of a relationship with um, her daughter Elizabeth? Because, of course, uh, Anne was executed when um, Elizabeth was, you know, just two years old. So did she manage to have much of a relationship or an impact on Elizabeth? Well, on the 7th of September, 1533, at Greenwich Palace, Queen Anne Boleyn gave birth to her first and only surviving child, a daughter who was baptised Elizabeth, and who, of course, would become Queen Elizabeth I. So I just want to set the scene here. Astrologers had predicted that Anne's baby would be the longed-for <coughs> boy, the prince that the king uh, wanted, the longed-for son and heir. So sure were the king and queen that they were going to be blessed with a uh, prince of Wales, that a celebratory tournament had been organised, um, birth announcement, a letter announcing the birth of a prince had been written in advance. And of course, when Elizabeth was born, an S was added to the word prince. Um, that Tudors didn't uh, have standardised spelling, so it wasn't a double S that was added, it was just an S. And the joust, the celebratory joust, ended up being cancelled. Now, you could read far too much into that and think that, you know, it was a complete disaster, Elizabeth's birth, the king and queen were just really unhappy and cancelled this joust. But that was actually quite normal. It doesn't mean that the king was furious at having um, another girl. As Eric Ives has pointed out in his biography of um, Anne Boleyn, and I really do recommend his The Life and Death of Anne Boleyn, he points out that, um, that celebrations for the birth of a princess were always much more low-key um, than for a prince. And um, back in 1516, when Catherine of Aragon gave birth to Mary, the celebratory jousts were cancelled then as well. It's just because it's a girl. It's not, I'm sorry, it's very sexist, isn't it? It's not the, it's not the prince. It's not the, the heir to the throne that has been born. It's just her daughter. Uh, so that was normal. But still, a herald proclaimed um, Elizabeth's birth. The chapel royal choristers sang the Te Deum, and the preparations started for a very lavish christening for the little girl. And she was christened at the Church of Observant Friars at Greenwich on the 10th of September, 1533, in a huge ceremony, um, the little girl just being three days old at the time. Anne did not attend. She was still uh, confined to her chambers as she hadn't been churched yet. And that was quite normal. But the baby was taken back to her chambers. There is absolutely nothing to suggest that Anne was disappointed with um, her daughter in any way. Um, recently, um, there's been a suggestion that Anne was so disappointed um, that she didn't bond with her daughter. And that has absolutely no basis in fact. There is no evidence at all that Anne was upset or didn't, you know, didn't bond with her, her daughter, didn't want her daughter near her or anything like that. Evidence actually points to Anne taking delight in her daughter and wanting to be involved as much as a person in a, of her status as queen um, could be in her child's upbringing. Now, Anne would not have breastfed her daughter, although breastfeeding was seen as the best thing you know, for a baby. And as Elizabeth's mother would not have breastfed her because it was important that Anne uh, gave the king another child, 
that hoped for prince as quick as possible. So she needed to conceive quickly. The story, the idea that she wanted to breastfeed, but that Henry VIII, you know, put his foot down and said, no, you can't do that. Um, that comes from a fictionalised account by Gregorio Letty and is not at all factual. Um, it would have been the norm for um, a wet nurse to have been chosen, a very well-vetted wet nurse. Um, it was believed at the time that a woman could pass on her sort of her personality, her characteristics to the baby in her breast milk. So the wet nurse, it was important that this woman was of good standing, was a good woman. So she would have been well vetted. And she's the one that would have breastfed uh, the little Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was removed from the royal court to her own household at Hatfield in December 1533, so when she was just three months old. And that must have been very hard for Anne as her mother. I just, I can't imagine what it would be like to, to see your baby sort of have to go away and for you not to be there in control. Um, she was put into the care of her nurse, Lady Margaret Bryan, who was actually related um, by marriage, I think, to the Boleyns. Anne kept in touch with Lady Bryan. For example, when instructions were sent to Lady Bryan uh, to wean Elizabeth at 25 months, the instructions came from the king with the assent of the Queen's Grace. And along with the King's instructions, there was a letter from Anne to Lady Bryan. Now, babies in the Tudor period tended to be weaned on gruel, bread and sugar, bread dipped in water or milk to make it soft. So I wonder if uh, Anne's letter was explaining what exactly she wanted her daughter to have or whether she was simply inquiring after the health of her daughter. We don't have that letter, so we don't know what she was saying to Lady Bryan. Now, we don't know exactly how much time Anne was able to spend with her little girl, but we do know the following. We know that Anne visited Elizabeth at Hatfield in spring 1534. We know that Anne was moved to, sorry, Elizabeth was moved to Eltham just five miles from Greenwich at the end of March 1534 and that her parents visited her there a few weeks later. We know that she was at court with her parents uh, for five weeks in the first quarter of 1535. We know that Elizabeth was at court at Christmas 1535 and was still there at the end of January 1536 when news reached the court of Catherine of Aragon's death because we've got that account of Henry VIII dressing in yellow and parading his little daughter with trumpets and that to mass. So Elizabeth was definitely there. And then, we're not quite sure about this, but there's a suggestion that she may have been at court at the end of April 1536, shortly before Anne Boleyn's fall. Alexander Eliseus, the scholar and theologian, described Anne as holding Elizabeth in her arms while she appealed to her husband while they were having some kind of argument. Now, David Starkey discounts this account, saying that Elizabeth probably wasn't even at court at the time. She was probably at Hunsdon. So we don't know whether Alexander Elysius is just getting his times and dates uh, muddled up or whether she was at court at that time when he witnessed this kind of what looked like an argument between um, Henry VIII and Anne. Anne appears to have enjoyed buying items for her daughter's nursery and for her clothing. If she couldn't be there herself, uh, you know, at her daughter's household, that she was going to be involved by ordering things for her little girl. The account of materials furnished for the use of Anne Boleyn and Princess Elizabeth 1535 to 1536 by William Locke and Mercer included fabrics for lining gowns, fabrics for partlets, for kirtles, for trimming and edging kirtles, for mufflers, for sleeves and for a bed cover. 
And then we have the debts owed by Anne at her death in 1536. And these included, and I'm going to pick out a few of them for you, boat hire from Greenwich to London and back to take measures of caps for my lady princess and again to fetch the princess's purple satin cap to mend it. A purple satin cap laid with a rich call of gold, the work being round ells of da damask gold made for my lady princess. A pair of pyrrhics for my lady princess delivered to my lady mistress. Now these pyrrhics or pillowinks um, were a device to straighten the fingers. I think it was Eric Ives that pointed out, or perhaps it was David Stark, you can't remember which, about how you know Elizabeth was known for her beautiful, long, straight fingers. And is it because she used these pyrrhics? Then we have two and a quarter yards of crimson satin at 15 shillings, an L of tuque, and crimson fringe for the princess's cradle head. Two fine pieces of needle ribbon to roll her grace's hair withal. A white satin cap laid with a rich cord of gold for the princess, four pounds, and another of crimson satin. A fringe of Venice gold and silver for the little bed. And a cap of taffeta covered with a cord of damask gold for the princess. Now, all of those items were in Anne's expenses. So they were all ordered by Anne personally rather than Elizabeth's household, rather than Lady Bryan ordering them. These were in Anne's personal accounts. And Anne's involvement in Elizabeth's life and welfare and, and things like this, ordering clothes for her child, that involvement is shown by Elizabeth's subsequent neglect after Anne's execution in May 1536. In August 1536, so that's just three months after Anne's execution, Lady Bryan, who was, as I said, Elizabeth's nurse, wrote to Thomas Cromwell about the lack of provision for Elizabeth, saying, I beg you to be good lord to her and hers, and that she may have raiment, for she has neither gown, nor kirtle, nor petticoat, nor linen for smocks, nor kerchiefs, sleeves, rails, body stitches, handkerchiefs, mufflers, nor beggins. So Elizabeth had obviously grown out of all the items that she'd had or worn them out and she's been badly neglected since Anne's death and Lady Bryan is you know saying what am I supposed to put her in she hasn't got anything um all because you know Anne who was keeping an eye on things and was ordering things has now gone um now thinking about Elizabeth's Household. I already said about how Lady Bryan was a Boleyn relative. Elizabeth was actually surrounded by Boleyn relatives from a young age. Her household included Lady Bryan. Um, her controller was her um, Anne's uncle, Sir John Shelton, and his wife, uh, Lady Anne. Um, Lady Anne being the Boleyn. Uh, Catherine Ashley was related to the Boleyns through her husband, John Ashley. Thomas Parry was a Boleyn relative. All of these people were linked to the Boleyn family in some way. And I do like to think that Elizabeth being surrounded by these people with links to her mother and her mother's family, that she was able to ask questions about her mother. Because I can't imagine a child not wanting to know about her mother. J.L. McIntosh, who did extensive research into Elizabeth's pre-accession household and also the pre-accession household of uh, Elizabeth's half-sister, Mary, wrote, The presence of these Boleyn relations and the evidence of Queen Anne's interest in the material splendour of her daughter's environment indicate that Anne, before her death, was an important, if indirect, early influence on the development of her daughter's household's culture. Henry VIII funded the household and had the final say in all important aspects of his daughter's upbringing, such as when she was weaned. But it was Anne who was guiding the routine behaviour and agenda of the household. And I entirely agree with that. Anne could not be a hands-on mother like, um, you know, we can be today and like a peasant, you know, woman would have been at the time. 
that was impossible when her daughter had her own household away from court and it wasn't Anne's role as Queen Consort. She had other priorities. Uh, she had to concentrate on other things. But she does, however, appear to have been involved as much as she possibly could. So we, we can see her stamp, you know, on Elizabeth's um, early life. On the 26th of April, 1536, so this is just a few days before Anne's arrest on the 2nd of May, Anne had a meeting, a kind of intriguing meeting, with her chaplain, Matthew Parker. Now, we don't know what happened at this meeting, what Anne said, what Parker said, but years later, when Matthew Parker reluctantly accepted the post of Archbishop of Canterbury in Elizabeth's reign, Anne's daughter's reign, and he didn't want this post, he was ill. Um, I think he'd had a fall from a horse and had been ill since, and he just didn't want the position at all. And he wrote to William Cecil, Lord Burley, saying that he would not have accepted it if he had not been so much bound to the mother. Now, and he talks about ha having talking to Anne just days before her arrest and being bound to her. Sorry, we've got a dog deciding that she's going to walk into the camera tripod. Um, and it, to me, it suggests that Anne extracted some kind of promise from Matthew Parker on that day in 1536 about Elizabeth's future. He felt bound to Anne in some way. He felt bound to serve Elizabeth in a job he didn't want because of what Anne said to him. She may well have asked him to do all he could to look after and support her daughter. And... We just don't know um, her spiritual welfare or just, you know, if she needs you in the future, please be there for her. We just don't know. We can only surmise, uh, speculate. But um, Parker was actually a man with connections um, and Anne would have known that. He was friends with the likes of John Cheek, uh, Roger Ash Askham, uh, William Sissel, Anthony Cook. Sorry, it's like Euston Station here with dogs going in and out of the room. Um, Anthony Cook, William Grindle, uh, John Dee, all, all men that were incredibly intelligent and scholars and that, and all men who Elizabeth would later rely on for advice and support. She would rely on these men in one way or another. Is that coincidence? It's hard to say. But I like to think that Anne got wind of a plot against her, that she she must have known that something was happening at court in by this time, the 26th of April, 1536. And that she was, by meeting with Matthew Parker, that she was taking steps to make sure that her daughter would be looked after. She would have had no way, obviously, of knowing that her daughter would ever be queen. But perhaps she was taking steps to make sure that her daughter would be looked after and there'd be people around that would keep an eye on her. Now, there is this prevailing myth, I see it time and time again online, that Elizabeth distanced herself from her mother's memory, that she liked to draw attention to the fact that she was the daughter of good King Hal, King Henry VIII, that she was the lion's cub, but that she was embarrassed by her link to her traitor mother and that she never associated herself with Anne Boleyn at all. <clears throat> well, that's an absolute load of rubbish. Uh, absolute poppycock. Um, while Elizabeth may not have made any effort, you know, to, to do what Mary did and overrule the annulment of her parents' marriage, um, while she may not have made any move to... <coughs> sorry, to um, 
to move her mother from the chapel of St. Peter Ad Vincula at the Tower of London to somewhere like Westminster. So while Elizabeth may not have done what Mary did and, you know, got her the annulment of her parents' marriage um, overturned, making herself uh, legitimate, um, she didn't take any steps to move her mother from the chapel of St. Peter Ad Vincula at the Tower of London to, you know, a more fitting uh, monument um, in Westminster Abbey or anything like that. Elizabeth was proud to associate herself with Anne Boleyn. Um, at her coronation procession in January 1559, um, Elizabeth had various sort of pageants, as was normal for a coronation procession. And at Gracechurch Street, there was a pageant referring to Elizabeth's family tree, her Tudor roots. And it included the following, and this is a description from a contemporary source. Out of the which two roses sprang two branches gathered into one, which were directed upward to the second stage or degree, wherein was placed one representing the valiant and noble Prince Henry VIII, which sprang out of the former stock, crowned with a crown imperial, and by him sat one representing the right worthy Lady Queen Anne, wife to the said King Henry VIII, and mother to our most sovereign lady Queen Elizabeth that now is, both apparelled with scepters and diadems and other furniture due to the state of a king and queen and two tables surmounting their heads, wherein were written their names and titles. So there you have, at her coronation procession, not long after she came to the throne, Elizabeth is drawing attention both to her mother and her father, uh, and having their names above them at her coronation procession. So she is not hiding the fact that she is Anne Boleyn's daughter. Then there's the fact that Elizabeth made good use of her mother's falcon badge. Now, you probably know that Anne Boleyn's badge was a crowned white falcon holding a scepter, standing on a log out of which grew red and white roses. Well, Elizabeth chose to use this badge for herself at times. It was used on some virginals that she owned, virginals being a musical instrument. It was used on napkins and probably the tablecloths that went with the napkins that were used to celebrate the opening of the Royal Exchange in 1571. Um, these also uh, displayed um, Anne's coat of arms as well. So you've got the falcon falcon badge and Anne's coat of arms um, and the falcon badge appears alongside Elizabeth's phoenix badge and Elizabeth's cipher ER on a book written by physician and scientist William Gilbert of Colchester which was published in 1600. So different times during her reign Elizabeth was being linked with her mother's uh, falcon badge. Then you have in St. Margaret's Church in Tivitchell, Norfolk, Elizabeth's arms are displayed above her mother's falcon badge. Now, Anne's falcon would not have been used with these things linked to Elizabeth if Elizabeth had not been happy about it. Um, you know, you could say, well, that napkin that was made for the Royal Exchange was, you know, made by someone else and not by, not on Elizabeth's commission. But they wouldn't have used Anne Boleyn's falcon badge if Elizabeth wasn't happy about it, if she didn't want to be associated with her mother, if she didn't want to draw attention to the fact that she was Anne's daughter. Then we have the rehabilitation of Anne Boleyn in Elizabeth I's reign. We have George Wyatt, grandson of Thomas Wyatt the Elder, um, who wrote his sympathetic biography of Anne, The Life of the Virtuous Christian and Renowned Queen Anne Boleyn. You can tell it's sympathetic by its title. He wrote that in Elizabeth's reign. Anne's former chaplain, William Latimer, wrote a treatise about Anne Boleyn as well, his Chronicle of Anne Boleyn. 
He wrote that in Elizabeth's reign too, another sympathetic biography of Anne, focusing on her charitable uh, giving. Um, then you have mart martyrologist John Fox, of course, famous for his um, acts and monuments, his Book of Martyrs. He um, wrote of Anne, his Anne, uh, in his book, is a Protestant heroine and martyr. <clears throat> so you've got this rehabilitation of Anne in Elizabeth I's reign. Um, if Elizabeth was trying to hide the fact that she was Anne's daughter, if she was embarrassed about her mother in any way, there is no way that these people would have written what they did. Then you have the fact that we have portraits of Anne um, that all date to Elizabeth's reign. You know, we don't have contemporary likenesses of Anne apart from the 1534 medal, the um, the very cartoon kind of like sketch from her um, Anne's coronation banquet uh, seating plan and possibly an image of her from the Black Book of the Garter. Um, the portraits that we do have of Anne, like the National Portrait Gallery famous one, date to Elizabeth's reign. So people were also painting portraits of this woman. And, you know, obviously for the Queen, I would expect. So far from being ignored and hidden, um, Anne Boleyn's memory was very much in the open. <clears throat> and all of this must have been supported by Elizabeth. Then we have the locket ring. Um, the intriguing locket ring, the checkers ring, as it is called, because it's kept at checkers, the um, country retreat of the uh, Prime Minister of the UK. Now, I've been lucky enough to see this ring in the flesh at an exhibition, and it is tiny and stunning. It's, it's just an amazing piece of jewellery. Now, this ring belonged to Elizabeth I. It's the actual ring part of it is made from a ring of mother of pearl, which is embossed with tiny diamonds and rubies. The ring setting, or the front of the locket attachment, was set with six diamonds, which formed the letter E, over a blue enamel R for Regina. The ring top also has a beautiful pearl, and it really is a stunning piece of jewellery. It's called a locket ring because although it looks like a normal ring, it actually opens up to reveal two miniature portraits. Now, and this would only be known um, that this would happen by the wearer. Uh, it's not obvious to other people, you know, that it opens up to reveal these. Now, when I say miniature, uh, miniature portraits, I mean miniature. I mean, the, the ring is tiny. It's just the size, you know, of your little finger now. You know, look at your little finger. That is how tiny it is. One portrait is clearly Elizabeth I. There's no denying that. And the other is of a woman wearing a French hood and <clears throat> with features similar to those of Elizabeth I. Now, is, there is controversy over who the sitter for this you know, portrait was, the identity of the woman depicted. Some argue that it's Catherine Parr, you know, Elizabeth's stepmother, who, you know, Elizabeth was close to, um, you know, when Elizabeth was in her adolescence. <clears throat> Some argue that it's a younger Elizabeth. But as Eric Ives points out in his biography, the costume of the lady depicted dates to the 1530s. He also believes that the features match uh, the portraits of Anne Boleyn as well. That is actually quite tricky to say when it is such a tiny um, depiction of a woman. I can't see why Catherine Parr would be depicted in this ring wearing 1530s costume when Elizabeth knew Catherine um, as her stepmother from 1543 to you know 1548 and then 
if it's a young Elizabeth, why would Elizabeth um, be depicted as a woman in 1530s costume when Elizabeth was a small child in the 1530s? Eric Ives believes it to be Anne Boleyn, and I agree with him. It makes sense to me that Elizabeth would want to have this private keepsake of her mother, to have it close to her, you know, on her finger. It's not on public display. It's something special and private. And it makes sense that it's her mother that she's got in this ring. And the more I stared at, at this ring in the uh, exhibition, and you couldn't tear me away from it, I was staring at it for a long time, the more it kept saying, my mind kept saying, that's Anne, that's Anne, that's got to be Anne. I just really felt that. And I know feelings, you know, don't come into play. But there you go. I was even more convinced when I saw it. It is so very sad and tragic that Anne never had the chance to see her daughter grow and that little Elizabeth was denied her mother in what was a travesty, uh, a miscarriage of justice. Now, the real Anne Boleyn never gave this prophecy. Elizabeth shall be a greater queen than any king of yours. She shall rule a greater England than you could ever have built. Yes, my Elizabeth shall be queen and my blood will have been well spent. Now that is a purely fictional speech given by Genevieve Bujold playing Anne Boleyn in the wonderful movie Anne of the Thousand Days. Um, I really wish that Anne could have had the opportunity in the tower you know, to have this visit from Henry VIII and just to tell him exactly what she thought. But Anne did not have that opportunity. But perhaps Anne would have felt that her blood was well spent. At her execution on the 19th of May, 1536, Anne, who we know had this fiery kind of spirit at times. She could rant and rave. She could say things that she really shouldn't, you know, putting her foot in her mouth at times. She could be very outspoken. But on the scaffold on the 19th of May, she kept scaffold etiquette, scaffold protocol. She gave the usual humble speech uh, and confessing to be, um, you know, um, deserving of death because of original sin. That's how people felt that everyone was deserving of death. She praised her husband, the king, the father of her daughter. And did she think of her daughter at that time? Well, I'm sure she did. And I'm sure she wanted to protect her daughter's future, her daughter's relationship with the king by not stirring up any trouble, um, but instead making a good, dying a good, a good death, dying with humility and not causing any trouble. It's Anne's daughter who has gone down in history as one of the greatest monarchs of English history. She ruled for over 44 years. She's known for her golden age. She is iconic. Everyone recognises um, Elizabeth I's portrait. Elizabeth made a huge impact on England and Anne Boleyn made an impact Elizabeth has to have been Anne's greatest legacy. Anne, Anne may not have been around for much of Elizabeth's life and I can't, you know, I can't say that Elizabeth became the woman she, she did because of Anne because, you know, Anne's influence, her potential influence, you know, that was all taken away on the 19th of May 1536. But I think she she did her best to put things in place for her daughter. And Elizabeth, she she may have drawn attention to the fact that she was King Henry VIII's daughter. She may have been the lion's cub. 
But I think she was also the falcon. She was the falcon's daughter. She used her mother's um, falcon badge. She she was proud to be a Boleyn. And I think we should remember that and not believe this myth that Elizabeth was embarrassed by her tr- traitor mother and never never mentioned her never did anything to do with her because that is a lie anyway thank you for bearing with me and uh you know coping with the fact that i'm full of cold and my voice isn't great um but uh, i'll be back with more questions about Anne Boleyn. well more answers to questions about Anne Boleyn uh, in the future and you can check out the rest of this playlist and you can subscribe by just clicking around about there and hit the bell to be notified of new videos because I do my On This Day in Tudor History videos as well but do have a good browse of the channel there are all sorts of uh, videos on Anne Boleyn, the Boleyns, uh, you name it it's there for you to enjoy. So I'll see you very soon. Thank you for tuning in. Take care. Bye-bye.